of Judges chapter number 4. Judges chapter number 4. And uh, tonight we're going to be looking at Deborah and Barak. Deborah and Barak. So Judges chapter number 4 and verse number 1. And the children of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord when Ehud was dead. So again, I underline that word again. They did again evil in the sight of the Lord. Uh, again. Can you guys identify with that? Can anybody identify uh, along with me that? <laughs> again. Uh, we've done evil again. In 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 22, it says this, But it has is, it is happened unto them according to the true proverb, The dog is turned to his own vomit again, and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. So, so the dog goes back, and, and those of you that have dogs, you know that dogs go back. If they throw up, they go back and they eat their own vomit. Uh, if you ever washed a pig, they don't like to be clean. They like to go back to the mire. And so just, just like that, human beings tend to go back to doing evil. And so again, in 2 Peter 2.22, that was the reference that I just read, uh, speaking about the children of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord. Let's look at verse 2. And the Lord sold them into the hand of Jabin, uh, king of Canaan, that reigned in, in Hazor, or Hazor, the captain of whose host was Sisera, uh, which dwelt in Harosheth, of the Gentiles and the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, for he had 900 chariots of iron and 20 years he mightily oppressed the children of Israel. And so again, uh, the Lord sold them into the hand of Jabin. Now the interesting thing about that is we've, we've seen the name Jabin and he was a king back in Joshua chapter 11. Joshua defeated him. So it's, it's thought that this name Jabin is, is the name for the ruler of the area, much like Pharaoh for Egypt. So instead of this being a man's name, many believe that this is a title that belongs to the ruler uh, of uh, Hazor or that region. Uh, and so again, Jabin could, it could be his name, but many believe that this is a title much like Pharaoh. All right? And then he has a captain. And the, the majority of this story is going to be about this captain Sisera, uh, which dwelt in Harosheth of the Gentiles, and the children of Israel cried. We saw them do this before. So again, the cycle is they do evil again in the sight of the Lord. God sends judgment in this case, it's Jabin and Sisera. And then the children of Israel cry out to the Lord. And the reason is 900 chariots of iron and 20 years of oppression. And so that's why we're crying out. Now, if you've been a slave for 20 years, don't you think you'd start crying out? Anybody? I don't like it for 20 minutes. My wife gets out the whip and she starts driving me in the house. You need to do this. And you, you, I had 20 minutes, I'm done. 20 years, could you imagine 20 years of that? Uh, and so, uh, by the way, my wife is the only one that can drive me like that. Uh, and so they were oppressed for these 20 years. And then verse number four, and Deborah a prophetess, wife of Lapidoth. She judged Israel at that time, and she dwelt under the palm tree of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in Mount Ephraim, and the children of Israel came up to her for judgment. 
And she uh, sent and called Barak, the son of Abinoam, out of Kadesh Naphtali, and said unto him, Hath not the Lord God of Israel commanded, saying, By the way, when a prophet or a prophetess says, Has not the Lord God commanded, saying, That's a command. It's not a suggestion. This is a command. And I'm, and I'm emphasizing this because there, there's a couple of times that she gives this same command to Barak. And so, hath not the Lord God of Israel commanded, saying, Go and draw uh, toward Mount Tabor and take with thee 10,000 men of the children of Naft, uh, Naphtali and the children of Zebulun, and I will draw unto thee uh, to the river Kishon, Sisera, the captain of Jabin's army, and his chariots and his multitude, and I will deliver him into thine hand. Did you see the whole command here? The whole command is get up, go, take 10,000 men with you from these two tribes to this place, and what's going to happen at that place? God is going to deliver Sisera and his chariots into their hand. So the command is with a promise. Do you guys see that? The command of God is given plainly, and the promise is, and God's going to take care of it. Right? Uh, read with me again the last part of that, verse number 7. And I will deliver him into thine hand. If God says he's going to deliver somebody into your hand, that means he's going to take care of it. All right? Now, let's look at Barak's response. By the way, I don't have a lot of respect for Barak. I believe he's a shame uh, to the race of mankind. <laughs> and Barak said unto her, If thou wilt go with me, then I will go. But if thou wilt not go with me, then I will not go. I need you to go with me and hold my hand. That's what I'm reading here. Deborah has just given the command of God to Barak. You go, you take 10,000 men with you, and God's going to deliver them into your hand. And what does Barak say? I'm not going to go unless you go with me. And she said, I am the man of this family. <laughs> no, that's not what she said. I will surely go with thee, notwithstanding the journey that thou takest shall not be for thine honor, for the Lord shall sell Sisera into the hand of a woman. Because you're not man enough to go on your own with the command of God and the promise of God, then the victory is going to be taken from you and it's going to be given to a woman. That's exactly what she's saying. And Deborah rose and went with Barak to Kadesh. And Barak called Zebulun and Naphtali to Kadesh. And he went up with 10,000 men at his feet. And Deborah went up with him. He had somebody to hold his hand. Can you tell that this is... It, it's not pleasant for me to be speaking about this guy. He had to have this person hold his hand. Now Haber the Kenite, which was of the children of Hobab, the father-in-law father of Moses, had severed himself from the Kenites and pitched his tent unto the plain of Zaanaim, which is by Kadesh. And so the idea here, this, this Haber moved his tent from the Kenites, from his people. He moved his tent from them and moved them closer to Naphtali because he wanted to live closer to the children of Israel. And so where his tent is, is between the Kenites and the tribe of Naphtali in the wilderness area. Now this is going to be important in just a little bit uh, because we're going, to, we're going to see this tent referenced again. And so it's, it's not in the children of Israel, it's kind of in the wilderness but it's, he's away from the Kenites. Verse number 12, And they showed Sisera 
that Barak, the son of Abinoam, ben, ben, uh, was gone up to Mount Tabor. And Sisera gathered together all his chariots, even 900 chariots of iron, and all the people that were with him from Harosheth uh, of the Gentiles into the river Kishon. And Deborah said to Barak, here's the second command. All right, you remember the first command. Take the 10,000 men, you go, God's going to deliver them. Here's the second time. Up, for this is the day which the Lord hath delivered Sisera into thine hand. Is not the Lord gone out before thee? So Barak went down from Mount Tabor and 10,000 men after him. And look at verse number 15. And the Lord discomfited Sisera. That word discomfited. The English word doesn't do it justice. The word discomfited there is the Hebrew word hamam, which literally means, and there's a whole lot of, of, uh, of definitions here, to move noisily, to confuse, to make a noise, discomfit, break, consume, crush, destroy. That's what that word means. It has all of those meanings. And so when it says, and the Lord discomfited, we could say, the Lord moved noisily, confused, made a noise, discomfited, broke, consumed, crushed, destroyed, Sisera. Now, do you think Sisera may have had a pride problem? Number one, he's the general of the army that has been oppressing the children of Israel for, for 20 years with his 900 chariots of iron. That's like 900 old Ford pickup trucks. All right, I know you Chevy guys just went threw up a little bit in your mouth. You remember the old Ford pickup trucks, the ones that were like metal? They were square, and you could drive them into anything, and you wouldn't hurt the pickup but anything that you hit was hurt. He had 900 of them. And, 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 uh, and uh, Barak only had 10,000 men. Of the two, do you think 900 Ford pickup trucks, the old ones, could run over 10,000 men? Put them in a line? Not, but not if the Lord discomfits you. Not if the Lord comes and destroys you, crushes you, uh, all of those other things, breaks you, consumes you. And so we see the command again, and then we see the fulfillment of the promise. Now, do you think if, if Barak would have told Deborah after the first command, I go, and he went, do you think in this Sisera would have been killed in this battle? I believe he would have been. But look what happens. It says, Discomfited Sisera and all his chariots and all his host with the edge of the sword before Barak, so that Sisera lighted off his chariot and fled away on his feet. So Sisera got away. But Barak pursued after the chariots and after the host unto Harosheth of the Gentiles, and all the host of Sisera fell upon the edge of the sword, and there was not a man left. Sisera runs this way. All the men in their chariots run this way. And Barak and his men run this way, chasing all of these guys, and Sisera gets off this way. Verse number 17. Howbeit Sisera fled on his feet to the tent of Jael, the wife of Heber the Kenite. You remember that guy we just talked about in verse number 11 that moved his tent from here toward the tribe of Naphtali, and so he's in the wilderness up here? Well, here goes Sisera. He's running away from, from Barak, and he comes across this tent. By the way, where is Heber? Where is the husband? So tradition tells us, now I can't prove this, but tradition tells us that Sisera killed him. Tradition tells us that Sisera killed him 
And that's why Jael is like she is. And we're about to see how she is. And so Sisera flees on his feet to the tent of Jael, the wife of Heber the Kenite. For there was peace between Jabin the king of Hazor, uh, Hazor and the house of Heber the Kenite. And Jael, verse 18, went out to meet Sisera and said unto him, Turn in, my lord, turn in to me, fear not. So she's running out of her tent. She recognizes who the man is and she says, Come in. And when he turned in unto her into the tent, she covered him with a mantle. Two reasons there. One, to cover him and camouflage him. Two, he was probably tired and needed to be warmed up. And he said unto her, Give me, I pray thee, a little water to drink, for I am thirsty. And she opened a bottle of milk. By the way, alongside with that, again by tradition, she gave him some butter too. And the reason is, uh, if you have trouble sleeping, don't you just go for some warm milk? And doesn't that help you sleep? And so she gives him a bottle of milk and gave him to drink and covered him. And he said unto her, Stand in the door of the tent, and it shall be when a man doth come and inquire of thee, and say, Is there any man here? Thou shalt say no. How did he know that there was no man there? Well, one, he didn't see any, but how did he know that her husband wasn't going to come back? It must be because he killed him. Thou shalt say no, verse 21. Then Jael, Heber's wife, took a nail of the tent and took a hammer in her hand and went softly unto him and smote the nail into his temples and fastened it into the ground, for he was as fast asleep and weary, so he died. Tent stake through the temples. And then if we, if we took the time, in chapter number five is the song, and we kind of looked at that song last week when we were talking about, uh, what was his name, Shama? Uh, was that right? Um, Shamgar. In, in chapter number five is the song that Deborah and Barak sang. Well, in that song, it's implied that not only did Jael drive a tent stake through his temple, but she smashed his head first with the hammer and then drove the stake in. Do you think there was some vindictiveness there? Do you think maybe she was a little bit upset with the guy that was laying down in her tent? And it's certainly not because they were enemies, because we just read at the beginning of that, uh, let's see, in uh, verse number 17, Sisera fled away on his feet to the tent of Jael, the wife of Heber the Kenite, for there was peace between Jabin the king of Hazor and the house of uh, Heber the Kenite. And Sisera was the general for Jabin, so there was peace there. So why would Jael want to bash his head with a hammer and then drive a stake through it? So again, that's just further indication that, yeah, maybe Sisera had something to do with the death of her husband and she was, uh, she didn't take too kindly to that. Any other wives along that? Now, now Amanda might welcome Of course, afterwards, she'd probably be a little upset and then. But any of you other wives, would you take a hammer to somebody and then drive a tent, 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 tent stake right through them if they killed your husband? I'll bet you some of you women would be, would be prone to that if they were sleeping in your house. And this was premeditated, was it not? Because she brought him milk for the intention of making sure that he was asleep and then she walked up quietly to him, bashed his brains in, drove a stake through it. So much so that it fastened to the ground. Did you guys catch that part too? Verse 
Verse number 22, and behold, Barak pursued Sisera. I guess he got word and heard that Sisera was running that way. And Jael came out to meet him and said unto him, Come, and I will show you the man whom thou seekest. And when he came unto her, uh, unto her tent, behold, Sisera lay dead, and the nail was in his temples. It's like she just left him there. So God subdued on that day Jabin the king of Canaan before the children of Israel, and the hand of the children of Israel prospered and prevailed against Jabin the king of Canaan until they had destroyed Jabin king of Canaan. When you, when you kill the general and you destroy his 900 chariots of iron, is there any protection now for your country? And that's what happened. Since, since, since Sisera was killed, and the 900 chariots were destroyed, and the army was destroyed because we saw that not a man was left standing, then the children of Israel was just able to go into Canaan and, and utterly destroy. All right, chapter number five is that song that I told you about. We're not going to look at the song, but I want you to drop all the way down to verse 31, the very last verse in chapter number five. And we're going to see how long the Lord gave rest under Deborah and Barak. It says, so then all the enemies perish, O Lord, but let them that love him be as the sun when he goeth forth in his might, and the land had rest 40 years. So after Sisera was killed, and after Jabin was killed, and after the Canaanites were destroyed, then the children of Israel were able to rest for 40 years. You know what they're going to do after 40 years? Evil again, <laughs> but we'll look at that next time. All right, any questions or comments about Deborah and Barak? The account there. Uh, they should have been because the Levitical line has been started and so they should have been. No, they did a horrible job. Uh, I, I don't think the Levites did a good job after Aaron and then even Aaron kind of messed up when he made the golden calf. So you really... Did they ever do a good job? There were those days, a couple of days, that I think they did a good job. But on the whole, I would say they failed miserably in, in teaching what the Lord had commanded. They were great at teaching what they thought. But they were terrible at teaching what the Lord commanded, what the Lord said. All right, anybody else, questions or comments? Deborah and Barrett. 